Are we expecting more people? We can start and then we can continue from here. Okay, we'll do that then. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nava. Um, it's very nice to have you here this morning in the dark. I can't quite get used to the fact that it's dark at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, just, I'd like to start, if you wouldn't mind just telling me, uh, I will take an earphone so I can hear you also in English. If you just tell me um, where you come from, your names, I'm Tell me your names, I don't promise I'll remember, but which university, what you're studying, you, are you all in the same program? No. So do you mind? We'll take it. I, I just, I'd like to know so that we can make this maybe more useful. Let's start on this side. Higher School of Economics. Your name? Igor. Okay. And behind you? No, that's right. Sergey. Sergey, and you're also in the Higher School of Economics? No. No. IT. IT. Okay. My name is Mark. I'm for, I'm studying in Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. Okay, I know that. That I know. <laughs> From the same school. So you go to all of these schools. You've decided to broaden your education. Okay, well, that's excellent. Thank you. Uh -huh. Moscow Institute of, sorry? Steel and Alloys, okay. In the same school, okay. Steel and Alloys. from the same university, steel and alloys. And that's a separate university or a separate school in the university? You're not sure? Okay, never mind. Never mind. Just for my own education. Okay. Thank you. Steel and Alloys. So there's a big group from Steel and Alloys. Okay. And good morning to my translator, whom I can't see because they're behind the window, but there's a very nice gentleman, I think. At least yesterday there was a gentleman. Um, I'm going to leave this for now. Here's what we're going to try and do this morning. Okay. Now that's so that I can understand you, but as long as you're speaking English, I'm, I'm okay. What we will try and do this morning in the next uh, little less than two hours is um, we'll talk a little bit about innovation in general. Um, we'll talk about the story of Israel and what it does and how it got there. And what I'd like you to do for me is to ask questions, make comments, raise your hand, uh, make it a little more interesting for me, because I actually know this. I've said this before. Um, but I suspect that what you have to contribute will be new to me. So that's, if that's okay with you, how I'd like to do this, okay? Um, we can, if you like, uh, there are four more sections to this, which uh, go into the uh, mechanics and the explanation of commercializing technology and how it's done. I'm not sure that that is the most interesting thing for you guys at the moment, but certainly we can go into that if you like. Good morning. Please join us in the front. So it's an intimate group, so I'm trying to keep you close to me. And um, But if you do have questions specific to commercialization or how we do deals about technology from universities, I'm very happy to go into that in more detail if you're interested. Um, if you need translation there, these little headphones, you can take one of those. Uh, okay. I know how to do this. Okay. I'll tell you a little bit about myself now that you've told me all about yourselves, or at least your names and what you're doing. Um, my name's Nava. I 
grew up in Israel. My parents are South African. I've lived in Europe, mostly Switzerland, a little bit in England. I've lived in the States, uh, lived and worked 10 years in total in uh, both of those places. I've been back in Israel for, I think, about 14 years now, so that's quite a long time. Um, I was originally a lawyer. I then got an MBA uh, in, in one of the top European schools, ended up in the pharmaceutical industry. That's where I got introduced to venture capital many years ago, before you were born. And uh, moved to California initially on behalf of what is now Novartis. It was then SIBA. I was a vice president there. And uh, became a partner in one of the big venture capital firms in California, in Silicon Valley. Uh, specializing in early stage investing in medical companies because I came out of the pharmaceutical industry. Then moved back to Israel, um, stayed in venture capital, uh, started my own fund, started a few companies, moved into another larger fund, and uh, then was asked to come and run the technology commercialization arm of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, which I did for a number of years. We'll talk about that and what that does and how we do that. Um, and for the last few years, I've been consulting to both companies on strategy and uh, international business development and also to government organizations and universities around the world about innovation and technology commercialization, doing a lot of public speaking, a little bit of teaching, and um, involved in a lot of international activities and boards. I chair the National Nanotechnology Conference. I'm the Israeli representative uh, to the OECD's Nanotechnology Commission, and uh, I'm also an advisor to the United Nations, among others. So I've moved between, I've spent my career in the private sector, with a little bit of touching on government as a consultant. I've never been a government employee per se, but I have been a consultant to government. I still am a consultant to government. And um, in between the worlds of business and science, I'm not a scientist, but I've done enough, and I've done enough scientific companies to be able to at least ask the right question. Um, so for you with your science and business and public policy background, uh, I think that's very interesting. I think that's also an interesting way to go. And we'll talk a little bit more about how this happens uh, and how you sort of move around. So why do we innovate? Well, first of all, the world is growing. Uh, it's growing by 40% or so. Uh, it's growing faster than it's ever grown. We all know that. And that raises a whole lot of problems. People need to eat. People need to keep warm or cold, as the case may be. Um, so we need energy. We need water. Clean water is still the largest health problem in the world today. I know it's hard to imagine here, but if you go to large parts of Africa and South Asia, clean water is a big health issue. Um, we have severe world problems on a, on a very big macro scale. Um, there is also a very fast growing pace of technology. Now this, I think you're close enough to be able to read, sorry, it's not a very clear slide, but it's a nice one actually, which shows on the time axis on one side and the development of technology on the other side, starting with, as you can see on the left there, the agricultural revolution, moving through, you know, things like the discovery of pottery and plows, you know, for plowing the fields and so on. Moving all the way through the first cities, which was a very big change. I know today urbanization is a big trend, but um, think of the first cities. You can actually see a similar trend in recent years in China, for example. And that's gone from being a very rural society where people live mostly in villages to, good morning, please join us in the front. We're a small group, so I'm keeping you close. It's okay, take your time. And that trend towards urbanization, what that means in terms of the technological needs, urbanization today is different than it used to be. We use different technologies and uh, we have different needs. If you need translation, there are these headphones here on the chairs. You want Russian translation? Yeah. Welcome. Okay. The advent of writing and printing, modern mathematics, um, and so on. And then what you can see on the right is it becomes very black, it becomes very dense. And those are some of the recent developments. And you can see how fast they're happening. 
It's no longer 100 or 200 years. You're talking about the uh, Industrial Revolution, and then you move into the invention of the motor car, and so on. That took time. Today, things are moving very, very fast. And um, my children can't imagine a world where we didn't have cell phones. And soon enough, they won't be able to imagine a world where we don't have sensors and Google Glass and virtual reality and things which to some of us, to me even, are science fiction. Uh, still today, although I deal with them and I work with them, but they seem science fiction. And to people who are even 10 years younger than you, like my own children, uh, it's just normal, it's natural. They think that this is just the way the world should be. Um, I suspect technology will change much faster for them as well, but maybe they're better adapted. Certainly you are better adapted. We grew up without these things. So still to this day, it takes us time. When I moved from my Blackberry to my iPhone, it took me time. You know, it's a nice machine, I enjoy it. I use it reasonably well, but it took me time. It probably took me longer than it would take any of you to transfer from one machine to another. It's just our skill set changes. So we're moving very, very quickly. Now, keeping up with that is very hard. Not just on a personal level, even on a personal level, you sort of have this feeling like you bought a new phone and then the next month, the next one comes out and you can never quite keep up. But on a national level, nations, regions, don't keep up if they don't innovate. They just don't, they stay behind. And you see some very good examples, uh, even in developed countries, countries that are now working very hard to keep up. Uh, Finland had Nokia. Nokia was a world leader. A few years ago, when you got your first cell phone, it was probably likely a Nokia, right? A lot of you had Nokia phones, I had a Nokia phone. Um, it's non-existent today, their latest phone is basically a camera. It's nice and yellow and you know, it looks it's very cool, but it's basically a camera. As a phone, it's nothing much to write home about. They are desperately looking for ways to innovate now. They're desperately looking for ways to make a difference and change back to being a technology leader, not just as a company, but also as a nation, because it's a small nation, five million people, they were very dependent on this big company. Uh, similar example from that field, BlackBerry in Canada. RIM is the name of the company, Research in Motion. Um, it's practically disappeared. Now, I was on the board of the Canadian uh, uh, commercialization entity, and RIM was their big claim to fame. They always talked about it, and you couldn't get through to the managers, and they were big, big, big celebrities. Now, they just didn't keep up. They didn't keep up with the pace of innovation. They didn't read the map correctly. A company, well, it still exists, but not for long, I suspect, not for long. So. Clearly, both on a national level, on an institutional level, on a company level, your own universities, your own universities to survive and thrive are offering new types of courses. Now, I can tell you this even without knowing exactly what they are offering, because I know enough universities in enough places, they are looking to offer what the world needs to keep up, not even to stay ahead, just to keep up, just to stay where you are. If you want to stay ahead, we'll talk about how to do that. Collaboration is absolutely essential. You can't do it alone anymore. So universities are looking to work with industry and big companies are looking to work with small companies. Again, it seems natural to you, but 20 years ago, when the pharmaceutical industry started looking outside of its own company, and I'm talking to you about companies that had 100,000 employees, not small companies, companies that had thousands of researchers, but uh, they realized that in order to stay ahead, they had to access innovation where it was happening. And it was not necessarily happening internally. So they went to small companies, they went to biotech companies, they went, if you want headphones, they're in the front. You don't have to have headphones, but if you want Russian translation, you want Russian translation, oh, you don't need Russian translation. But still sit in the middle, it's nice for me to have some people in the middle. Uh, if they wanted to stay ahead of the game, they simply had to make a change. Now, big companies, small companies, universities, research institutes, we're seeing a flow of information that we never saw before. And again, it might seem natural today, it's a very new phenomenon. It's a, and it's growing all over the world. Now it has different definitions in different countries which we can talk about, but it is changing. There are new types of, uh, there are new types of initiatives and we talked a lot actually yesterday with the university administrators and executives about 
commercialization catalysts, these new entities that are growing that sit in the core of universities, companies, government, and the marketplace in order to really integrate all of those entities into a successful innovation economy. Um, we can talk about how those happen and how those might happen here in Russia. There are various initiatives. Um, there were some false starts, but I think that things are picking up now here as well. The essential part of all of this is the human component. I suspect that's why you're here. Um, I know that's why I'm here to speak to some different groups uh, because it requires a different type of skill set. It requires a different type of training. It requires thinking already in the early days of your training, and you are young, soon to be scientists, engineers, business people, graduates, um, you will at least be aware of the fact that there are commercial applications to your work. You know what? Your parents' generation, I can assure you, wasn't aware of that. They never stopped to think that what you do, the work you do, the metals, the alloys, the materials, the whatever, there's an IT guy, right? Physics that that actually had a commercial application, that you could make money on that independently from what, was, what it was being used for today. It just wasn't the way people thought. And it's got nothing to do with the fact that it was Russia or Israel or the US. It was just a different way of thinking. The way of thinking was different. And that is changing now. And the understanding that there is a potential commercial aspect, not to everything, but just think in the back of your mind, this is possible. Maybe I've invented something new. Maybe I should think of patenting what I've invented. Maybe there's something I can do with this on a commercial scale that's different from what was done before. That's a different way of thinking. And that's something that I think the entire generation of today and certainly the generation of tomorrow understands today partly because of the growth of innovation because of the growth of places like Silicon Valley, like Route 128 around Boston, like Israel, like other innovation hubs around the world, um, where people are successful in commercializing their ideas. They make a lot of money, which is excellent. Success breeds success. It brings other people to the table. And that's part of what we're seeing now. We'll also talk a lot about that last point, which is the global orientation. And again, Everyone speaks today a certain level of English, not because it's such a fantastic language, but because it is today the international language of business. Um, and we'll talk about Israel, and I'll mention again, we work in English. Again, now it, for me, well, it happens to be my mother tongue, different story. But everyone works in English because that's the language of high tech. That's the language of young companies. It's the language of innovation. It's the language they will use because Hebrew, well, you know, it's even less international than Russian, a whole lot less international than Russian. You can't go very far if you'll have manuals and correspondence and, uh, and deals that you're trying to do in a language that most of the world doesn't speak. It's just a small manifestation. But the whole global thinking, it's here to stay. It's not changing. It's not going back. I had questions yesterday which I found interesting about nationalistic boundaries. You remember those questions. And and the question essentially was, well, how do you deal with the fact that countries still, you know, want to look after themselves and their national boundaries, and why do you say it's all international? Well, newsflash. Yes, governments will always want to look after themselves because they have taxpayers' money and they have responsibility to their citizens, but that is changing very, very fast. And the way to look after your own is by collaborating with others. That's why you're seeing growing alliances. That's why you're seeing growing collaboration. And I think we're gonna see a lot more of that in coming years. Think about this for a minute, read it. Because there are five key words in this sentence. And they're actually... Они в середине предложения. Пять ключевых слов для меня. Это то, за что люди будут платить. Потому что у нас может быть очень хорошая идея, замечательная технология. И, возможно, вы можете сделать что-то такое, что никто раньше не делал. Но если это никому не надо, и никто не хочет за это платить, это останется тем, что это есть. То есть хорошая идея. 
And I know it sounds very obvious. You're looking at this. Я знаю, что я знаю, что вы будете удивлены. And how many companies try to push out products that nobody needs? And they fail. And they fail for that very, very simple, basic reason, which is they never stopped to ask the market what it needs. They never spoke to potential consumers. They assumed people wanted what they wanted, which, you know, is a good assumption sometimes, but not always. And that is actually the number one reason for failure, especially with technologies that are sophisticated in terms of the technical capabilities. Simply inventing things that people don't need and then trying to push them out into the marketplace. So remember that if there's one thing you take home from today, it's that for which people will pay. It will come back in different forms uh, as we speak. And really, it's the intersection of these three circles down here. What's possible with the technology, which is what we just talked about? What's desirable to users in the sense that you as a user, what would you like to see as a function? And what's viable in the marketplace, which in other words is, you know, for which people will pay. Steve Jobs, one of the world's greatest innovators, who actually has convinced many of us that we need things we never thought we needed, but that's, you know, a different, that's a different story. Uh, and who also failed, by the way, you won't remember this, but over 20 years ago, Apple launched a product called Newton. And Newton was actually the first PDA. The, before PDAs had phones in them, there was, you know, they were like a digital diary, sort of, it was quite large, but it was a, and it flopped terribly in the marketplace. It was too early. People didn't realize there was any use for this. It was long before Palm Pilots, which I suspect, again, you don't remember, but those were the generation of PDAs that became very prevalent and were then replaced by Blackberries, which already had the phone function and so on. But, uh, so they had failed with things that, people weren't willing to pay for, that the market didn't realize it needed. But, uh, but it's a wonderful quote, of course, about distinguishing leaders from followers, and uh, certainly a wonderful leadership for all of us to follow. Some of the things that are being done, again, this is on a national level by countries and regions, but the same thing is true if you think of, your, of an organization, of a company. Some of you are working in companies, right? Or will be working in companies? are working in companies, are working in companies. This is true at the company level too. It's also true at the university level, so any institution. If you want to innovate, you know, these are sort of four key elements. One is there's got to be high level focus. In the case of a country, at the very highest levels of government. I had the unique pleasure of sitting down in a very small meeting with your prime minister a year ago. And he sat, Mr. Medvedev, with Mr. Chubais by his side and five or six other people in the room, Richard Branson, a few others, myself, and asked us how to make Russia more innovative. And he had a legal pad, you know, one of these yellow pads, and he was taking notes himself. I, he, may, he may have had aides, but I didn't see them. They were nowhere to be seen around the table. Maybe they were in the back somewhere. But anyway, he took his own notes. He asked very good questions. What he does with that, I don't know. I mean, I've seen some of the initiatives, but I do know that it's very unusual to see that level of commitment at that level of government in a country the size of Russia. It happens in smaller countries more often. But um, to me, that gives hope. It means that someone at the top wants to make a difference. There are lots of things to deal with, mostly culture, which we'll talk about, but at least the high level commitment is there. What happens at the next stage is not enough, but it's essential. So that's the first point up there. Supporting R&D obviously is key. And um, Russia has always had excellent science, excellent technology, excellent engineering. And if it maintains that and continues to support that, both with research and with education, that's a good thing. Supporting innovative new companies and projects is something that's being done here there were a number of false starts, but I think that on the whole, there is a desire and a commitment to support new types of entities. The system's not quite in place to make this happen from what I see, but that again is very, very important if you're going to create a new type of economy.
and I'm talking about direct support, so funding, things like incubators, gap funding, and so on, which we can talk about, but also about indirect support, so tax breaks, incentives for investors, getting the right types of players involved in the innovation system. And the last point, I promised I'd be going back to partnerships. Last point on this slide again is the new types of partnerships because you can't do it alone. And again, obvious, but you'd be surprised. It's not obvious to everyone. It's certainly not obvious to the old guard that still thinks that you know, companies do business, universities do education and research, um, investors invest in the public markets, and they don't necessarily meet. Well, they have to. So all of these new models we'll be talking about as we move along. One of the concepts that's become very popular in recent years is the concept of open innovation. Are you familiar with it? Is this something you study at university? No? Okay. Open innovation is a phrase that was coined by Henry Cheeseborough from Berkeley University in California. And the idea really is something that to you is today very obvious, but it was new as a concept a few years back, which is the idea that companies, in particular businesses, go wherever they need to go to find the innovation. So it's an open innovation system in the sense that you take things from other companies, from smaller companies, from universities. It's this whole idea of a hub into which innovative ideas and technologies are brought and, of course, taken out as well. That was a change in thinking when he coined the expression. And today, it's an obvious practice for most technology-based companies. So just a term you should be familiar with, that's the cover of the, the book. There have been several other books since then, but it's something worth knowing. This, of course, presents a great opportunity for academia. Universities have a fantastic opportunity today to work more extensively with the private sector. It gives them money, it gives them access to ideas, it gives them access to development, because universities don't develop technologies. Universities, in addition to educating people like yourselves, they do research. They don't develop products. I mean, let's remember that. The research can lead to products, but they don't develop products themselves. So there are lots of opportunities. And as you can see in that sort of very nice uh, structure over there, it really goes to say you go from the very existing market through various innovation programs, incubation programs, venture capital, to having a, uh, um, an open innovation system that leads to the development of products with external collaborators. And it gives them not just money, but it also gives them insight into what the world needs and into what they should be focused on. On the applied side of the research, again, not basic research. Basic research will always be curiosity-driven, not necessarily related to the market. And that's fine. It should be that way. Ernst Hemingway, which you would not have thought of as uh, someone you would quote on innovation, said that now is no time to think of what you do not have. Think of what you can do with what there is. And I like that quote because it, it simply goes to say, don't sit there saying, well, but we don't have funding, we don't have knowledge, we don't have management for startups, we don't have and we don't have and we don't have. I go around the world and half the time that's what I hear. We don't have, we don't know how to do. But you know when you sit and think of what you actually have, you realize very often that you might not have all five components, but you have two of them or three of them. Or one and a half, but they're very strong and you can work with what you've got. And that is, that's actually, it's a general lesson for life. I'm a great believer in positive thinking. Not in any new age sort of way, but simply positive thinking of saying, okay. Because uh, we're going to talk about failure and positive thinking is very important because you will fail. Trust me. Anyone who takes risk fails. Uh, the trick is not to avoid failure. The trick is what you do when you fail. And positive thinking is very helpful in that regard of saying, okay, what have I learned? But in the same way, here, what do you have? What do you have? What does Russia have as a country? What does your university have? What does your company have? What do you personally have? What can you work with? I have this skill set. I have this knowledge. There may be 
two or three things that I don't have, let's go and get them. You're certainly young enough today to go and get whatever you don't have. Um, but that's, that's a nice way of thinking of things. And then, of course, sorry. No? Do you mind if I sit? Is that okay for you if I sit? Can you see me? Sorry. It's a small group. I may as well be comfortable. Um, is it enough? No, it's not enough. It's not enough to just have an idea. Uh, but it's essential, but it's not enough. So, you know, it's a start. But uh, I'm not talking just about an idea. What you might have, think of it. I, I, you might have an idea. Okay, everybody has ideas. You have contacts. You actually all have more contacts than you think you have. I'm not just talking about people who come from the quote unquote right families or, you know, a privileged background or money um, or political contacts. I don't mean that. Think of it. You're at a university today. You're good students by definition because you're here. Um, you have professors, right? Each and every one of you has a few professors, one, two, or more, that you're closer to. They have contacts. They'll do things for you. You'd be surprised. If all you want is for them to put you in touch with someone because you have this idea and you want to discuss it, that'll happen. One tool that I found very powerful, very simple, but very powerful, is asking people for advice. I still ask people for advice. Everybody loves giving advice. Try that. No one will ever say no to you. Try it. You will thank me one day. No one ever says no. If you approach someone pleasantly and you say, I'd like your advice, it'll open almost any door, even people you don't know. And certainly as young professionals, as recent graduates, as people starting out in your careers, most established people will be very happy to give advice. And very often, they'll give more than advice. They'll make a phone call for you. They'll put you in touch with someone. They'll connect you with an organization or a person who can help. It's a very powerful tool. And, uh, and I know it sounds simplistic, but it really isn't. It's, um, we all have a natural tendency to want to impress people with what we know and what we have. So very often we approach people and we start by, you know, showing off. We all do yeah, when you're older as well. Um, and do a little bit of that, you know, get your short pitch ready because people want to know what you have to say. But mostly if you approach people and ask for their advice, and if you know what you want from them, which again is a very important element, you need to know what you want. You ask them for one thing, maybe two, but mostly one thing. Say. I'd like to get your advice on who I should speak to about this idea. How do I get in touch with people in company X because I think that they are the right partner for me? A very specific question, something that makes it easy for people to respond and focused. And the other thing, since we've sort of taken a bit of a tangent here, but the other thing on that is take control of the follow-up. If you do ask people for advice and you do ask them for help, take control of the follow-up. What I mean is, you'll sit with people and they'll say, fine, I'll get back to you. And you'll say, thank you very much. Can I call you next Tuesday at 12? Next Wednesday at 6, whatever. But take control of the follow-up because people want to help, but everybody's very busy. And if they don't get back to you, it's, it's not because they don't want to. It's mostly because life just, you know, has its own pace. And again, very pleasantly, you don't have to be pushy, but if you take control of the follow-up, it's true of job interviews as well, by the way, but if you take control of the follow-up, then you're a lot more likely to get the response. And people will appreciate that. If you're pleasant about it, not, you know, pushy, not aggressive, but people will appreciate it. They'll appreciate the fact that you're trying to get something and that, you're persistent in obtaining the answer, the contact, whatever it is that you want. So that's just sort of a very general word on uh, some of that. Where's my thing? Don't worry, we're not going to cover all of this. Okay, uh, basically what I was going to do with you is go through the first two sections. 
But we can go through the rest if you're interested. It's all here. And Constantine knows how to put these things up. And he's going to put up the second presentation for me. Because your computers speak Russian and I don't. Now I'm going to tell you a story. It'll take about half an hour. Feel free to jump in. Has anyone been to Israel? Okay. Does anyone have friends who've been to Israel? Okay. No, we're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. Okay. I'm going to tell you the story of Israeli innovation. It's not the whole story of Israel, but the story of a big part of our economy and where it is now and how we got to where it is now. And I think you might find it interesting and inspiring in some way. Has anyone seen this book? Book called Startup Nation. Anyone who's interested in the startup world, I advise you to read it. I didn't write it. I am quoted in it. I don't get any royalties if you buy it, uh, but I think it's a good read. Um, I was unable to find a Russian translation, but I find it hard to believe that there isn't one. It's possible that I just didn't find it. I thought there was one, but I couldn't find it. Anyway, it exists in all sorts of languages, including Polish and Thai. So, you know, it's quite possible there's a Russian translation, but certainly the English is very readable. It was written by journalists, so it's, you know, it's not an academic book. But it tells the story of Israeli innovation in an interesting way. It's become a bestseller, and it sort of, the term startup nation has stuck in the last four or five years. Coming up on the screen behind me are a number of inventions and products that have come out of Israel that you use every day or used to use every day. Flash memory, disk on key, developed by a company called M Systems, acquired by SanDisk, and you know, so common today that you don't even stop to think, it's totally generic. There's probably one stuck in here somewhere. Um, that was originally based on technology developed at the Tel Aviv University in Israel. Uh, the drugs in the middle, cancer medications, medications for multiple sclerosis, uh, over half of the world's population of multiple sclerosis patients, uses medications developed in Israel, in fact, at Israeli academic institutions, um, different types of medication, for, but uh, a very large percentage of the population. Down at the bottom are the algorithms for cable television broadcasting, a company called NDS, based in Jerusalem. Technology came out of the Weizmann Institute of Science. Intel and Microsoft, a lot of the components of the chips and the operating systems developed in Israel at their uh, R&D centers. ICQ, you don't know ICQ, but ICQ was the first instant messaging technology in the 90s. It was acquired by AOL, which is also not a big name anymore, but it was the very first instant messaging technology. We all use instant messaging now. It's kind of common. You know, I'm on WhatsApp all the time. So, but ICQ was the very first one. And when it was acquired for $400 million by AOL, it was, you know, the deal of the year, more than a year actually at the time. The pink logo with the funny looking computer on it. That's Checkpoint technology software. Checkpoint developed the world's first firewalls for computers. We all have firewalls on our computers today. We don't even stop to think about it. But in the 90s, we didn't. That was because we didn't all use the internet. Very few of us had access to the internet. Uh, but Checkpoint was started by three young guys who served together in the military, in the intelligence units, and started developing this technology, turned it into a company, when they left the military, and still run it today. One of them still runs it today. And it is still the world's largest player in the firewall and uh, safety business. Now, to film at the top is drip irrigation technology. I suspect 
some of you might have gardens or in your parents' home or plants, whatever, but you know the pipes with the little holes in them and valves for watering your plants, which in hot countries like Israel and others are absolutely essential because we don't have enough water. Uh, but even in colder countries, you don't just want to water. You want to water where you need to water. That's Israeli technology. It's one of the most famous Israeli technologies. It's been very successful. Um, and uh, that technology, specifically the valves that open and close uh, with sensors in them, are uh, not very sophisticated by today's token, but were very sophisticated in the 60s when they started doing this. Inside Tech is a very cool company. They use high-focused ultrasound, that's for the physicists in the room, for the treatment of uh, lesions inside the body without cutting it open. So that you can, with high-focused ultrasound, treat various conditions. It's very, very exciting technology. Sorry. I'm back. Mind you, we did have a snowstorm in Israel over the weekend. The first one in like 100 years in the Middle East. So we didn't deal with it very well. Some houses still have no electricity from Friday. So, um, Agriculture. Israel's very well known for agriculture. Uh, cherry tomatoes, peppers, other types of seeds. These are not transgenic seeds. These are hybrids that were developed at the Faculty of Agriculture of the Hebrew University and are the focus and the mainstay of some of the big seed companies in the world today, Syngenta, Vermoran, and others. Waze, has anyone come across Waze? Waze is a, is a social-based GPS navigation application. It sits on your cell phone. Um, it's got over 50 million users. Uh, it's based not just on, on GPS, but also on the whole social aspect that uh, people actually put in information so you have real-time user information in the system as well. And there are all sorts of other functions. You can connect through Facebook. You can let people know that you're coming and what time you'll be there. You can pick them up on the way, all sorts of things like that. Um, very useful. We use it all the time because it's the best way of getting places. It's actually more accurate than any of the others because of the social aspect. It was acquired by Google in June of this year for a billion dollars in cash. Up at the top, Prime Sense. Those are the sensors in the Kinect systems. And that was acquired by Apple um, two weeks ago for about $350 million cash as well. Um, so these are just some of the things that you're going to see. Oh, by the way, Converse there with the uh, colored flower in the middle, those were the first voicemail boxes. And again, voicemail today is kind of antiquated technology, but 20 years ago it was brand new and it was developed in Israel to name but a few. I'm going to end with a very, very cool technology, given imaging on the top left, another company that was acquired a few days ago for around a billion dollars. Um, that's very cool technology. What they did is they took a miniature camera that was developed for a missile head. So it was developed for military reasons. It's a very small camera. They encapsulated that camera in a pill. It's about so big. Large-ish pill, but something that you can swallow. And you swallow that pill. And it takes pictures on its way through uh, for diagnostic purposes. Now, that's obviously a whole lot more pleasant than having fiber optic wires inserted in various ways. And also gives a very good and accurate picture of things that you can't necessarily see with the fiber or, you know, can't see throughout the whole length. And that's also an example of something else that's been done in Israel all the time, which is using military technologies for non-military applications, mostly medical applications. But these are some examples of things that have come out of Israel. Let's do that again. Okay. We spend more on R&D than any other country in the world, about 4.5% of GDP. The average OECD spend is about 2%. And I don't know why Russia's not on the slide. Maybe it's less than 0.6. That is possible. Um, I didn't find a, an updated Russian figure. However, it's a big number. Okay, it's a big percentage of the GDP of a small country, but it's still 
a very, very high percentage, even compared with other small countries like Finland and Sweden, which are fairly high up there. Korea spends a fair amount, Germany, the US, you can see, and so on and so forth. It just goes to say that we spend a lot of money on this. It doesn't happen by itself. And we are today ranked in the top positions on all of their about uh, five or six parameters on the slide of uh, innovation, whether it's the availability of venture capital, the availability of highly skilled people like yourselves, um, the innovative approach, the international outlook, the accessibility to uh, public markets and also private funding, all of those Israel ranks very high today. But it didn't 20 years ago. This is a fairly new phenomenon. That's not where we started. We started out, and I'm sorry, that actually in the circle is trying to show you Israel, but it's very small, so it's hard to see on a comparative map of the world. Uh, it's about 20,000 square kilometers, give or take, 21,000 square kilometers. It's a new country, it was founded 65 years ago. It's isolated politically and, well, physically because of the political isolation. And we've managed to find the only corner of the Middle East that has no natural resources. Everyone around us has oil and you know, gas and so on, we don't. Which is very innovative, you have to admit. But uh, we did recently find some gas. There's one pipeline, it started flowing in April of this year. We'll see. It's all very new still. So life gave us, as the Americans are fond of saying, life gave us lemons. And let's see what we did with those lemons. A small country, what we developed as a culture, which is interesting, is an interdisciplinary culture, which means that our physicists talk to our biologists and our business people talk to our engineers, mostly because they live close together and they know each other. And Israel, when it started in 1948, there were 600,000 people. That's not a lot of people. So they talk to each other. And it's a hallmark of Israeli society that it is very open. Everyone's very plain spoken, I should say, sometimes rude, but certainly plain spoken. And there's a lot of communication across different disciplines. Today, many companies, many universities, certainly research institutes, are trying to create that interdisciplinary culture. They put people together physically. They put the labs next to each other. They build new buildings. Harvard's got a $200 million new nano center where they put people next to each other so that they talk and collaborate, the chemists and the physicists and the biologists. It sort of happened naturally in Israel as part of being really a new and a small society. Being a new country actually can have advantages. It means that you are not tied to old traditions. You don't hear from people, well, we've been doing it this way for 100 years. There was someone here yesterday who represents a university that's 185 years old. We actually have a university that's 90 years old, but uh, because we have two universities that were founded before the State of Israel, interestingly enough. But uh, mostly what it means is that when you go out to solve a problem, you just go out to solve a problem. You're not tied to a traditional way of doing it. Manufacturing, industry, there's, there wasn't anything. So it started new. And that's actually a very important element. Because if you look at countries that have strong traditions, look at the energy sector, for example, in this country, which is you know, a good example. You've got certain ways of doing things. And changing those is expensive. It's difficult. It requires people to think differently. It's hard to change. Sometimes it's easier to do something afresh, to do it new, to go out and say, OK, what do we need to do? How do we solve this problem? Now that's very interesting. You see, I think I just discovered how to go back, but I'm not sure I can do it again. Okay. Oh, well, things are gonna happen on their own now, fine. Um, it's isolated. It's not just small, but it's isolated. We're not popular with our neighbors. I'm not going to talk politics, but it's a fact of life. We have no 
open land borders that are commercially active. We do have, in theory, open uh, borders that you can go across with Egypt and with Jordan, but there is no commercial activity uh, in those areas. And there wasn't for 50 years an open border at all. On the west is the Mediterranean Sea, and then the other countries are, as I said, not really uh, commercial partners. So we developed two things. One is, obviously, as everyone knows, Israel has developed a strong military capability. And the strong military capability has two aspects to it. One is technology. We talked a little bit about one example. There are lots of other examples uh, of technologies developed for the military that are then used for other applications. We have capabilities, and they're in obvious areas. They're in optics, they're in physics, they're in uh, various types of engineering, materials, new types of materials, in aerospace where we do have capabilities. We don't build cars in Israel, but we do build planes. Um, and certainly we build systems for you know, aviation systems, uh, and we build all types of weapons. Um, mostly we import a lot of weapons and put our own systems on them. So there's a lot of that happening that is a technical capability that spills over into other civilian areas. The other aspect of this, though, which is interesting and relevant, is people more or less your age in Israel serve in the military. We have conscription for men and women. It's a minimum of three years for men and two for women. Usually longer, because if you're an officer or if you serve in a certain profession, it's longer than that. I am myself a retired captain. I was in the military for, well, long enough to become captain. Um, it's not something that we particularly enjoy doing. It's not something that I recommend because it's not relevant to most countries. But it's a given, and because it's a given, we've turned that to an advantage. Because think of it, what happens is that at a very young age, you find yourself having to work in a team, so teamwork. You find yourself having to solve problems, real problems, not simulated problems, sometimes life-threatening problems. I mean, people do die, you know, in the military. It's that sort of thing. Um, you find yourself having to deal with extreme adverse conditions, which you don't have to deal with in regular academic life or early working life or whatever. And what comes out of the other end of that are really, think of it, they're startup teams. They're teams that can work together, that can solve problems, that can move quickly and find you know, agile solutions that can deal with adversity, that can always find a way around a given situation, because that's part of what you do. And in a strange way, that's become a very important element of the success of Israel as an innovative technology-based society. No one thought of it, trust me. When Israel instituted conscription, it was because there were not enough people in Israel, and it needed a large army, and they just, you know, it, the, the numbers don't match. We also also have in the military, the, so when you've done your few years, however many you've done, um, you then have to serve in the reserves. Sometimes that's a long time. If you're a pilot, for example, in Israel today, it's nine years in the military. You also study, you have your uh, first degree by the time you're finished. It used to be seven, now it's nine because of the studies. And then one day a week, so do the math, 52 days a year, in the reserves until the age of 51. That's a long time in the military. Uh, but of course, it's expensive to train a pilot, so they, they are needed and they're needed to work. But that's just one example. Even if you're in the infantry, if you're doing sort of more of a classic military role, again, you have a lot of time in there, which keeps you in touch with the technology, with the people, with that sort of thinking. So it's a given, but it's been turned into an advantage. The more important aspect for me of the isolation is the fact that we don't have a local market. And so if you don't have a local market and you're starting a company or a business, or you have to think of you know, where you're going to go with this. And Israeli companies, by definition, are born global. They're born global because they have no local market. If you try to develop a product for sale in Israel, even today, and we've grown and we have 8 million people, you're not going to get very far. That's not a big enough market. That's the size of a city in most other countries. So you have to think globally. Now, you start by thinking, well, am I going to go to the US? 
or to Europe, or to Southeast Asia, maybe Central Asia, whatever the case may be, but it's obvious that it's international. You don't even start to think about, do I have an international strategy or so no? And born global, which is another buzzword today in the business world, is just the way companies are. And that's what I mentioned before. You work in English, you write in English, because you know that very soon you're going to be dealing with investors, you're going to be dealing with clients, you're going to be dealing with partners, you're going to have to forward information. You don't want to start translating it at that stage. So you just work in English. And you correspond, you might speak Hebrew, but you correspond with each other in English because that is just the language of business. That's the way we work internationally. It's true on the academic side as well which is partly why Israel ranks very high on the international various publication indices, partly because the science is very good, but also because the science is very good and it's in English. Because if the science is very good and it's in Russian or in Chinese, it doesn't get onto the international rankings. One of the issues in this country, by the way, which always had excellent science but never ranked very high because most of it in the past was published in Russian. And a big issue today in China as well. I was there... Uh, uh, six weeks ago. Big issue because, again, they still publish in Chinese, which is lovely, but not a great international language, although a quarter of the world's population does speak it at the rate they're growing. But the international outlook is very important, and your market today will be everywhere. So think about that if you're going to start a business. The fact that we have no natural resources, and in fact not even water, Israel has one small lake, Sorry to tell you this, but the Sea of the Galilee is a tiny lake. It's really small. It's got a good name, but, you know, it's a nice name. But, and Jesus and all that, it's wonderful. But mostly, it's a very, very small lake with not enough water, which is why Israel is the largest uh, user of desalination technology. Over 60% of the water in Israel is desalinated, so we use water from the sea. It goes through desalination plants, and most of the agricultural uses and others, industrial uses, is desalinated water, because there just isn't enough fresh water to go around. Um, and there are, we always have these big campaigns about conserving water, close your tap, don't use a lot of water, don't shower for more than three minutes, all of that. Uh, um, really, because there isn't enough water. But as a result of having no natural resources, you develop what you have, and what Israel had for many years was simply brain power. Education, professions, the ability to innovate. That, that's one of the very big things that was developed. Last but not least, immigration. Israel grew from 600,000 people in 1948 to about 8 million people today, 65 years later. A lot of them came from here or from this part of the world, not just Russia, but the former USSR. In 1991, about a million people came to live in Israel. Israel at the time had 5 million people, population of 5 million, and it grew by 20% in the space of about a year and a half. We had to find jobs for these people. And these are a million mostly highly educated people, mostly engineers. Russia at the time produced lots of excellent engineers. But no country, no company can grow its workforce by 20% overnight. It's just not possible. There aren't enough jobs to go around. And people need jobs. They come to a new country, they need jobs. One of the things that was done was Israel opened 26 state-funded incubators. And the idea was very simple. You have technological skills, you maybe have an idea, here's a little bit of money, two years, try and develop your idea. And if you're successful, you'll create a job for yourself, maybe even some jobs for others, maybe a successful company. If you fast forward 20 years, that incubator system, which is now entirely privatized, so the state still funds, helps funds the, fund the projects, but the actual incubators are private. That has become one of the cornerstones of the Israeli innovation system. And I can tell you, because I know this, I wasn't living in Israel at the time, but I was consulted by, by the ministry about s various aspects of this. I was living in California then, um, in the mid-90s. And no one thought that 20 years later we would still have all these incubators. No one imagined that they would be such an important part of today's innovation system. But the fact is that they grew 
out of this need to provide jobs, primarily for the immigration from this part of the world. Because this was highly skilled, uh, this was a highly skilled workforce. Not, you know, we had immigrants from some other countries with different challenges. But here, these were people who could potentially create their own jobs, and some of them did. So that's just one example of, you know, how things turned into a culture of innovation, or how, in other words, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. We have enjoyed some smart government intervention. Don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but we have a science and technology agency, which is called the Office of the Chief Scientist in the Ministry of Economy. I don't know why. He's not a scientist, the chief scientist, but um, it is the main in a science and technology innovation agency that supports industrial-focused R&D. This is not for academic research. This is to support R&D that has potential industrial applications. Um, Israel made a strategic decision to have a military industry, to have military R&D capabilities. And I'm going to tell you one interesting story. We talked about the incubators, but I want to tell you about venture capital. Because venture capital in Israel, interestingly enough, was created by government intervention, which you wouldn't think, but it was. 1992, there was one venture capital fund in Israel. And the government came to the conclusion that it needed to provide some funding to support the very, very early stages at the time of the high-tech industry. So they put $100 million to work, which is not a lot of money for a government. And that $100 million went into 10 funds. And the way these funds were structured, the government put in 40% of the money. They, had, they were $20 million funds, which today is funny, but at the time it was enough to do early stage investing. So the government put in $8 million. They had to raise into each. They had to raise $12 million and bring in a partner that was an established venture fund elsewhere. And 10 funds were created with very, very good partners from the US and from Europe. And local teams that grew into the backbone of today's venture industry, which as you saw in Israel is today the second largest in the world in terms of the availability of capital. There are about 3,000 startup companies in Israel at any given point in time. Well, they change, so. That government fund was privatized some years later. It's been private for a long time. I mean, the government's no longer in the venture capital business. But it was a very interesting example of government intervention. Then the government pulls out and lets the market do its thing. So I'm not a big advocate of government intervention. But in the case where the government can move in and move out, it can be very effective to take care of certain deficiencies in the system like the incubators, like the venture capital, just as an example. We also have a lot of programs that support the early stage commercialization of academic research, which is another area where the private sector doesn't do so well. There's a gap there between academic research and commercial interest. And there are programs to support that very early stage of commercialization. If anyone's interested, we can talk about them. And various other programs to address certain needs as they come along. So multinationals, very early stage funding. There are some strategic initiatives. I want to give you one example in the area of nanotechnology because, well, something that I'm involved with, but also something that's relevant for some of you. I'm not going to talk about this unless someone has questions. I want to mention one thing, though. One of our binational collaborations, those are managed by a certain agency. We have over 40 of these. So Israel's part of consortia, but also part of, you know, we have binational collaborations with many countries around the world, including here in Russia. Uh, there are a few. And there is one with Rosnano. There's actually an existing agreement with Rosnano. And there's also an existing agreement with Skolkovo. Um, so both of those are you know, available for funding for small companies in both countries that want to work with each other. I want to give you an example of nanotechnology because it's actually a very interesting one. And it gives you an idea of how you make things happen. Nanotechnology has existed for longer than 10, 15 years. But it wasn't, it didn't know that it was nanotechnology. You know, it wasn't called nanotechnology. It wasn't looked at as an industry or as a particular section. 
The first nanotechnology drug in the world actually comes from Israel. It's a cancer medication called Doxil that was developed at the Hebrew University. And it's already off patent, which means it's over 20 years old. Um, and when it was invented, nobody called it a nanotechnology drug. Only later on, because it's about 100 nanometer particles, um, it became known as the world's first nanotechnology medication. But a little over 10 years ago, the decision was made that nanotechnology was emerging as a field with its own name and characteristics. And Israel had the potential to be a major player. And therefore, the decision was made that, to have a national initiative for nanotechnology. And the national initiative had a dual goal. The first was to establish the scientific capabilities and scientific excellence, which is obvious. But the second was to establish, from the beginning, close ties with industry and to have potential commercial output from this program. So not just excellent science, but excellent science that would turn into products. And that is quite unusual when you're looking at the national level in establishing a new, a new program. Six centers were established. Israel has eight research universities, so the six relevant ones have nano centers today. The government only put in one third of the funding. Another third had to come from the universities, from their own budgets. Um, and another third they had to raise from charitable contributions, donations, philanthropy. And those are the areas of priority that are mentioned there that you can see. Five years into this program, there was a, it was a five-year program, funded a total of $250 million. Um, and I'll show you the results of the first five years, which have led to a second five-year term. Interestingly enough, and you can read the numbers for yourselves, but I want to point out a few things. Firstly, yes, we have scientific excellence. There are 6,000 papers in leading scientific journals with all the right citation indices and so on. But if you look at the numbers, you'll see that 20% of those papers were published in collaboration with industry. And that's very interesting because when you're talking about such early stage academic research, it's not obvious that you collaborate with industry at that stage. 20% of the papers published in collaboration with industry already in the first five years. 185 issued patents. There are many more patent applications that were submitted. There are close to 200 what they call success stories, which are either licensed products or new companies that were formed. About 85 companies formed as a result of this program. Many research groups, there are over 300 research groups, uh, there are about 1,300 researchers, and close to 90 new faculty members that were repatriated into Israel. One of the things Israel suffers from is brain drain. We train more good people than we can employ in our universities. And one of the goals of this program was for each of the centers to bring back two people per year. So two, six centers, two people per year. Do the math. They've actually done better than that. 88 people who came back, tenured positions with labs, with students, creating a next generation of people in this field. These are mostly younger people, so they bring new blood into the universities. I became aware of this in a very funny way. I was running the commercial arm of the Hebrew University. I was looking for new products and technologies beyond the classic medications, drugs, and agriculture that we always made money on. And I started seeing a lot of exciting things coming out of the nano center. New materials, energy, exciting stuff. Also, they used to come to me all the time and ask me for reports because we did all of the intellectual property, the patents and the commercialization and the industry relations. And initially I said, well, why do you need all of this? And I said, no, we won't get funding for next year if we can't show that we have submitted X number of patents and Y number of industry collaborations. And I thought, well, that's rather interesting and that's how I personally got involved in that and then started the national um, conference which I still chair and that's a very big event uh, with over a thousand people from 30 some odd countries. But these are some of the numbers from the first five years which only goes to show that with relatively little money because the government spent a hundred million dollars on infrastructure. With relatively little money you can actually create a ripple effect, you know, like throwing a stone into the water. 
and creating that ripple effect, which was done quite successfully. These are some of the small companies. Don't worry, I don't expect you to read this, but you can go online and click on each one and it gives you all the information. These are some of the big companies working in the nano field today. And it's today an established industry. That's the next conference at the end of March. And I think we're going to see some people again from this organization joining us as they have in recent years as well. Questions? Yes. How to build a good team? That's a wonderful question. Well, a good team needs to have different disciplines in it, whatever disciplines you need, and that varies by company. But mostly, it needs to have the ability, the people shouldn't be the same, okay? From, and this I'm telling you more as a venture capitalist, because, you know, I'm used to looking at teams. If you have three or four people who are the same, that to me is always a warning sign. I like to see people who have complementary skills, even complementary personalities, because when they deal with problems, they will bring different aspects into dealing with that problem. And that's one thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is obvious. You need to have obviously cover the relevant skill set, technical, the business, and so on. You need to be able to work together. It doesn't mean you don't fight. You will fight. You will disagree. But you need to be able to find a mechanism to reach a solution, agree on the solution, put the arguments behind you, and move forward. And that is not as easy as it sounds. Because you do need to be able to argue, but you do need to be able to move forward and actually rally behind something. There needs to be a, s a fairly high level of support for each other. And again, that's, it's very hard to put your finger on that, but it's something that you know when you see it. You need to be able to trust your teammates. You need to know that even if they originally disagreed with something, they will be 100% behind it because you know, it was decided to be the best thing to move forward. It's not always your childhood friends who make your best teammates. Sometimes. Not always. Um, and another thing to be aware of is that sometimes teams change along the way. Not in the very early stages usually, but sometimes, you know, there will be changes along the way, and that's okay. That's okay. Successful teams of entrepreneurs are not very large usually, there are three or four people. Three is kind of a good number because it gives a balance, you know, it's like a three-legged stool you know, that you sit on. It gives a good balance. Um, you'll usually have one person with more of a business background or business capabilities. You'll have one person who's very technical if it's, you know, a technically based company. Um, and you'll have another who can take that technology and integrate it into a product. Usually those will be the basic skill sets. Uh, but that can change. Sometimes you need someone who's more marketing oriented. You need someone who can be the foreign minister. You know, sometimes that's the business person. Usually that's the business person who can talk to the outside world. Um, those are some of the basic skills that you need. Most of the other initial support you can buy or you can get from outside legal, accounting, so on and so forth. Um, but that core needs to be there and it needs to move forward. I think that the basic agreement among the team members, if you're talking about founders of a company, is crucial. It doesn't have to be even a written agreement. I know successful teams that never had written agreements, but it does need to be clear what you put in and what you get out, and everybody needs to feel comfortable and fair. You all saw the movie about Facebook, right? You know, so we don't. We want to avoid that if we can. Um, we can't always avoid it, but we we try to avoid it. We try and have a, a, a fairly clear understanding. If you get funding, then they'll want agreements in writing. So there's time to do that. 
but it is very important that you have an, an agreement and again among yourselves does is that more or less what you were asking about oh, sorry. i'm listening is that what you were referring to We'll talk about some of this now, because what I want to say a few words about is what I think are the important elements of the innovation recipe. And these are not specific just to Israel, but you know, in general, to countries, but also to companies, also to ideas. And there are only three elements to this. There needs to be the infrastructure, there needs to be the right environment, and mostly, that's why it's red and big, there needs to be the right culture. Now, when I talk about infrastructure, I mean the sorts of things that you would expect. You need to have the education, you need to have uh, the right type of research, you need to have the availability of smart funding. That doesn't mean just to your own company, but as a system, smart money should be available because otherwise it's very hard to start a company. You need to have the management skills, you need to have the ability to protect your intellectual property. Obviously, you need to have facilities to do all of these things. And we haven't talked at all about intellectual property. We will. But at least as a system, it needs to be able to protect that. When I talk about environment, again, these are things at the macro level, but the availability of capital usually requires certain regulations, certain tax credits, a certain system, and so on. Access to the market, we talked about access to the market. And the access to the market doesn't necessarily mean that you have a big local market, but that you can get to the market. You know, for many years, when you couldn't take money out of Russia, for example, it was very hard to do business here. There was just a whole lot of crooked business going on, but it was very, very hard to do business here. And a lot of people who looked at the world globally said, you know what, that's too much of a headache. Forget Russia, there are other markets in the world. It's too complicated. We can't get paid. If we get paid, we can't take the money out, the, you know, exchange rates and so on and so forth. It was, it was just way too complicated. That's the sort of thing that hampers an innovative environment. It needs to be easy to do business. Ideally, there should be some form of institutional investment. That is the banks, the pension funds and so on should participate in the game, which actually doesn't happen so much in Israel, but that's a different story. Most of the Israeli innovative economy is funded from outside by foreign investors, from the US, from Europe, to a certain degree from Asia. Very little of it is local money, but that's a slightly... Huh. Now, how do I go back? Is that back? My Russian is getting so much better. Um, it's usually the second item, right, on the presentation going back, but anyway. Um, but most importantly, and that's really, that goes back to what I said right at the beginning about Israel, most importantly, it's culture. And the most important point on this slide, of course, is the third point, which is learning to fail and learning to embrace failure. Successful innovation economies, successful innovative regions, Accept failure as part of the game. Now, don't get me wrong. Nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants other people to fail. But it's part of the game. It's most likely that if you take risks, each and every one of you, if you decide to start companies or businesses or make changes, you will take a risk and you may fail. And that's okay. Sometimes it's even good. Provided you learn your lessons, we all learn our lessons. I know that I have learned from everything that has failed for me. I also know that as an investor, when a new team came to see me and told me that they'd had something before and it didn't work out, the question is, can you tell me why it didn't work out? What did you learn from the experience? And if there's a good answer to that, then that's fine, that's even good. Because it means that you've learned something and you know what you learn yourself from actual failure and actual loss is um, a lot more powerful than what you read in books. And if you ask any successful entrepreneur, they will all tell you that they have had failures along the way. 
And successful innovation economies will enable you to fail. They won't encourage you to fail. They won't give you prizes for failing. But they will accept the fact that failure is part of the game. And that is the single most difficult element to integrate into, I'd say, non-innovative societies. Classic economies. The Italians, the French, the Swiss. My Italian friends have done a lot of work in Italy in the past year. And they say, you know, we can't fail. We'll never get a second chance. Finished. You fail, you never get a second chance. Um, which is, you know, part of the problem. And again, understanding that it's a real risk and that it can happen is all that's required. I'm not encouraging you to fail. I'm simply saying it is part of what might happen along the way. And I'm saying at the macro level, as an economy, you need to be able to do that. And it is 180 degrees from having a safe government job, which is the classic way of working in many parts of the world, including this part of the world. Because we all know the pluses and minuses of having a safe government job. In fact, I suspect that in Russia, like many other economies, safe government jobs will not be so safe anymore. Certainly not if you start out now. It's happened in other countries. It's happened in Switzerland, where people had employment for life, and suddenly when they didn't have employment for life, they started innovating. There's a whole new innovative pharmaceutical industry around the big companies in Basel, where the big companies are. And it came because about 15, 20 years ago, the company started firing people very gently, and they didn't call it firing. They called it whatever they called it, resizing, what have you. And they were very generous. You know, they gave people good terms. But basically, they were firing them. They were taking away their lifelong employment. And what happened as a result of that is all these new companies sprung up because people didn't have the option of lifelong employment anymore. So they were forced to take a risk, and they did. But changing that culture is not easy to do. It changes with generations. Your generation is different from your parents' generation. But I had a very funny experience, actually here in Moscow last year, speaking on a panel at this Open Innovation Forum, right? It was a big conference, whatever, thousands of people. And there was someone from the US government, and there was someone from MIT, there was someone from, I don't remember, England or somewhere whatever, myself, and we're all told, we were asked to talk about entrepreneurship and innovation and how you encourage it. And it was all this very upbeat discussion. Lots of good questions from the audience. Great discussion. And then someone got up and said, yes, I understand all of this. But would you want your son, who has just graduated from a top US university, to take a job with a startup? And, and, you know, it was very funny, uh, obviously, you know, in the context of the discussion, it was a funny moment. But I felt for this man because, you know, he understood all of it. He even asked some very good questions. He understood all of this. He was a smart guy. He understood all of this. He followed the discussion. He asked good questions. But then, you know, bottom line, in his heart, for his child, he wants a safe government job or big company job. Now, now That'll take a lot longer to change than the understanding of you know what it means and the upside and the mentality and so on and so forth. So you know, this generation is different. The next generation will obviously be different. But and yesterday I was speaking to someone here over dinner who said, "Well, my son, he's whatever, thirty-ish something, so a bit older than you. He has this basically government job." He doesn't make very much money, but he's happy. He doesn't want to take risks. That's okay. There are plenty of young people who don't want to take risks, but there are those who do. Maybe not want to take risks, but understand that in order to make all of these wonderful things happen to you, a risk-taking or an aptitude for risk-taking is essential. So that's sort of part of this whole, um, this whole change and this whole culture change. And it's particularly evident in countries that have gone from, you know, like Russia, the entire sort of former Eastern Europe, um, but a lot of other countries as well that have gone from being very solid 
economies with a lot of with a big public sector. France, by the way, is also a very good example. France has an enormous public sector and big companies and people who are used to doing things in a certain way and very traditional and it's hard for them. When you talk to them about startups and, and I was on the board of a French company, some of the discussions were hilarious. Some countries are just very comfortable. Canada, for example. Life is really good. When well, life is good, you don't take risks. It's just it's a fact of life. You typically take risks when life is not so good. It's like Israel. <laughs> Things are not so good, so, you know, innovation happens. So I think here for you, interesting opportunities. You've still got a great education system. You've got a good background, good technologies, and so on and so forth. And things are beginning to happen. So everyone makes their own personal choice. It's also a question of personality. You need to be happy with a life that's less secure, certainly in the beginning. Um, you need to want the upside and you need to be willing to fail. That really is the message on the slide and on the summary slide for the sort of recipe. But um, the understanding that this takes time, not for you individually, for you individually things are happening now. And usually if you can do a few years, get some experience in an existing company, a bigger company, uh, you know, because you learn things from work. I learned more from work than I did at university, for sure. And I think that's true for anyone, because it's just the way it is. You need that practical life experience. Before you go out and do your own thing, if you choose to go out and do your own thing, you might not. It's also okay. Um, that's usually a good balance. And from the little that I know, I'm not an expert on Russia. I'm, you know, I've done a few things here, but I'm not an expert. But from the little that I know, I think that there are a lot more opportunities available to you now than there were certainly to your parents' generation, but even 10 years ago. And there's a need in the market for people who think a little bit differently and still have a very good background but are willing to take it in a slightly different direction. So that's sort of my two cents as a non-expert on Russia. If there are additional questions, I'll take them. What to do with high -tech, sorry, what to do with high-tech companies? How to reduce risks? Wonderful question. Wonderful questions primarily because one of the hallmarks of internet, you, you're talking about internet-based companies, is that they usually don't have intellectual property, strong intellectual property, so patents. And patents are an asset. We can talk about patents if you like. It's not that interesting. It's fairly technical. but. Uh, they don't have an asset, so if it fails, it fails, there's nothing there. You know, you don't have a patent that you can sell or something that you can monetize. But I think that the way to reduce risk is true across the board, and it's particularly true in those types of companies, and that is you start from the market. You don't start from the technology. You don't sit there and say, well, I can do this. It's fine that you can do it, it's essential, but it's not enough. You need to start by saying, what's the need in the market? What is the market likely to pay for? What is it likely to desire? Sorry. And if you have a good understanding of the market, you're more likely to succeed. Doesn't mean you won't fail, but you're more likely to succeed. Look, to be honest with you, who would have thought that, you know, birds shooting pigs would be a successful business? You know, Angry Birds some years ago. Or Candy Crush, or all, you know, the stuff that, a bit hard to tell what's going to catch and make money. There's an application, I actually just downloaded it. It was developed by some students at the Hebrew University. It's called Facetune. And you pay for it. I mean, it costs whatever, it costs $3 or something. And, uh, and it's essentially like a sort of uh, editing application for photographs, but it's very easy to use. It was made for smartphones, so you know it's all finger-based and so on. And so it's like Photoshop for cell phones. 
but very, very intuitive and very easy to use. Um, that I can sort of understand, because in, you know, in this day and age, and that's where they started from, we're saying, well, we can do it, technically. But also, everyone has pictures, you know, we all live in the virtual world, uh, we all want to make ourselves look a little better. Um, therefore, and we all use our cell phones, because you know, that's where we are now, so let's use the skill set that we have to develop something that people might use. And they, they're very successful. They're actually, I think, making money now. Um, so that's one example that's maybe obvious, a world that people use. The games, I can't tell you I understand. I don't know. I don't know what's going to catch. I don't know what. It, I, it's a mystery to me. Uh, I'm not a big game player myself, so maybe that's why it's a mystery to me. But even my friends who are big game players, go figure. You never know what's going to turn into something or not. But some other things, for example, I gave you earlier the example of Waze. Waze is a good example. And it's a good example because it was designed as an application. It was designed with the understanding that the cell phone market is only going to grow, that everybody's going to have a smartphone on them, because when they started, you know, smartphones have grown exponentially in recent years. The iPhone was already out, but not the newer versions. Um, it was, so it was designed to be an application rather than a standalone device. You know, the old GPS you used to have in your car was a separate device. Um, it was designed for a market of daily commuters, for example. An interesting thought. Because you would think that something like that that's on your cell phone, like Google Maps, I travel all over the world. Very often I switch it on to see where I'm going. If I want to walk somewhere, because sometimes, you know, it's three minutes walk and it's 20 minutes by taxi. So, you know, that's not what this is for. They very clearly had a strategy that said, we are going after the daily commuter, the people who drive to work every day. And we're going to give them a different route every day that's quicker, that's better, that has less traffic. So what you've done is you've created a community of people who switch this on every time they get into the car. It's not an incidental user. To be honest with you, I only use Google Maps when I travel because it's more global. You know, if I'm in Israel and I need to go somewhere, I use Waze. I get into the car, I switch on Waze. Even if I'm not going to use it because it will tell me, you know. And even if I'm going somewhere, I know, I know the way. I know the way to my office. It's the same way every day. But no, it doesn't necessarily send you in the same way. So that is an example of strategic thinking that says, okay, let's understand the market. Let's see where there's a need. People want to save time going to and from work. Let's go after that segment of the market, which seems initially a strange decision. Because you'd think instead of having 50 million users, we'd have 150 million users if we went after the incidental user as well. But there isn't, there isn't even a, a pedestrian option. It's only for cars. There isn't, you know, like Google Maps has a pedestrian and it has uh, like a bus, public transport, and then it has a like, car. I used it, I was in Hong Kong on holiday. I used it all the time to take the bus because it's easy by bus. Very nice. But that's not what this is. This went very clearly after a certain market, after a certain segment with a very clear strategy. So that's just an example of the type of thinking that minimizes risk. Understanding your marketplace, doing a lot of research, and the research doesn't mean you know paying someone to do theoretical market research. It's really about going out there and understanding what people might want. Um, you do need to get lucky a little bit with some of these things because sometimes there are trends in the marketplace that are very hard to anticipate. That's why these types of businesses are a lot riskier than technology-based. I, I, when I, mean, I say technology, I mean if you've got an actual technological asset, an actual product rather than an application or a software-based and uh, so on. Um, but I'll tell you the upside of that, they're relatively cheap, so it's not expensive to fail. And it's relatively quick. So it takes you six to 12 months, and you spend whatever you spend, which really mostly is your time and earning power of a small team. And then if it fails, it fails, and you move on to the next thing. You know, the other extreme is, for example, biotech. But there's no one here in there. But, but you can develop something for years, and then it fails, and it'll cost you millions. That won't happen with an app. 
So the important thing is never to lose sight of the market. When you're working and developing and living on pizza and Coca-Cola, whatever, in the middle of the night, you must always go out there and see. Get people to use your beta. Get feedback on a constant basis. Understand that even small things in the user interface can make a huge difference. Because when you look at what's available to us today, you know, I can open the App Store every day and there'll be 10 new things that I've never even thought I needed. So getting to that one thing that people will need is tricky, but I think that you probably can do it if you have a good ongoing dialogue everywhere and not just locally. Does that help? Ask them. Ask them. No, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny. Seriously, ask them. And um, define to yourself, usually you start with the circle that's around you, okay? That's why, you know, students usually develop applications that are useful to students. And it, it, it's just the way it is. Young parents develop applications that are useful for young parents. Someone talked to me now about an application for babysitters. You know, which is act actually, it was very interesting because this was a group of young people at an incubator in Rome. And, um, and they were looking at finding jobs for students. Okay, so the idea was to match students with young parents who wanted, you know, someone to look after the children and the students are available at certain times and sometimes those times are good so this was the idea now of course to the parents that's very attractive because these are well educated you know sort of good young people um, and and this whole sort of matchmaking idea makes a lot of sense but they were coming at it from one aspect they had to then go out and understand the whole other side of the market because you've got two sides here that are very different markets it looks like they're succeeding so far from what i've seen and heard and now they're going internationally to um you know, because they in italy they did this in italian italy doesn't work well in any other language um so now they've translated this and they're moving into other markets but that's just an example where you start with what's close to you so what's close to you is the need to find a good job for the students that works with their timetable. The other side of that, the user end, is you know these young parents with the children. So that they had to go and research. And so far, so good. But when I say ask them, you have an idea. You have some concept of an idea. Sometimes it's not even a final idea. You need to find your potential users, your potential market, and go out and ask them. I'm actually a great believer in legwork and that type of market research that's, um, that really has you talking to potential customers. Look, you're absolutely right. It's not so much do you need this, but do you want this, and will you pay for it? Because if you need it, you'll pay for it. You know, def by definition, if you need it, you'll pay for it. But there are lots of things that we want, and then there are lots of things that we don't even know we want. Because, I mean, you know, come on. You need to shoot sweets? Or whatever. Nobody needs to shoot sweets, but everybody seems to. Um, so... Defining your question very clearly is a big part of getting the answer. And defining your target market is again a big part of getting the answer. You know, one of the fastest growing online businesses now in the States is a, a matchmaking service, you know, a dating service for married people. Who would have thought to have an affair? They're all married. I mean, the men and the women. So, well, the men, I don't know, most of the women anyway. But the, it's very clear, it's very well defined. 
and you go online and you look for whatever you're looking for and, and, and so on. I was reading an interview with the founder. It's astounding to me. I mean, the fact that somebody thought of this as a business is amazing to me. And it's obviously a good business idea because it's growing very fast and people pay. It's all paid. There's no free access. Like, I don't know why I haven't accessed it, but, uh, but it, it's an amazing idea. Think of it. You would have thought that there'd be a market for that sort of thing. I wouldn't have. I, at least I know everybody has affairs, but I wouldn't have thought that people would actually be willing to admit to themselves that they're going to have an affair and go out and look for one and pay for the search you know, pay to access a service that will provide. That may be an idea for Russia. As far as I know, it doesn't exist here yet. But um, but it, it's just an example of something that obviously the person who started it had some sort of a notion that this would make sense. He came from the um, online dating matchmaking market and realized that there was a segment here that was underserved. But I'm just, you know, giving you an example of something that personally I never would have thought of as, as a business, and yet it's working and it's uh, succeeding. In general, by the way, in that space, there are some amazing applications that, I, I don't know, I never would have thought would be successful. The, there's one that finds people at airports. Have you heard of that one? You, you find people at airports. So like if you're traveling, you find someone who's in the same airport who has time to spare and who's interested in meeting. It's a concept. It's a fast enough growing concept that I read about it in one of the, you know, one of these um, uh, online sort of uh, interviews with innovators and it's growing and people have invested in it and it's making money. Uh, so, you know, you never would have thought. Um, but those things are, can be very hard to find. I think that usually the things that succeed are the things that you intuitively understand, the things that are closer to you, the things that appeal to a market that you might be part of or the people around you might be part of. Those are usually the things that succeed. I, again, the example of Facebook is an excellent example. It started, you know, for personal use. Some of the things are less clear. You look at Twitter. Twitter's not obvious. It's not obvious. Um, it's very hard to see what the fashion is going to be. You know, the kids today, not you, kids, kids, I mean, my kids. Facebook, they say, well, yeah, it's for old people. Nobody, nobody has Facebook, not interested. They do Instagram. That's what they do. And you know what? Tomorrow morning, it'll be something else. That's a huge market if you can actually access it. Huge, huge, huge market. But kids are very fickle. Because today it's Instagram, and tomorrow it's something else, and then it's Vine, you know, with the videos. Um, it was Tumblr, but Tumblr is now not, no, not interesting anymore. Um, in general, it seems to be less and less text, more and more pictures. Um, sometimes they put two words on the Instagram, but that's about it. Um, but, you know, there are things that are really very, very hard to foresee. Um, there's some great new applications in that respect, the whole sort of communication space, the whole social networking space. Um, I forget the name of it, but there's, there, there's more than one, but one is very successful. These things that self-destruct, have you heard of these? It's like an instant message that self-destructs after maybe 30 seconds or a minute, or it, you can, it, it's timed. So you can send someone a picture or a video, and yeah, that's right, Snapchat. But there's another one, there's... Um, that's the one I meant that was the biggest one. But again, think of it. When you think of it, it's almost obvious. Because one of the things that bothers us about these things is, firstly, you end up with a ton of data, you know, that sits there. And secondly, you know, it started for other reasons, but, uh, but it makes a lot of sense. You know, you send someone something and it disappears. After they see it, it disappears. Uh, so that, to me, is a brilliant idea. You know, whoever thought of that, brilliant idea. Um, same, and you can do videos and so on as well, which makes sense. But again, it comes from a certain understanding of the way we use the technology and what the next wave might be. But in general, just talk to them. No other way. Talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to each other. Um, go out and talk to potential customers. 
No. Think of the things you do on a daily basis. For example, you shop. How would you like to shop? You shop for different things. You shop for groceries, right? So that's a daily thing. You shop for clothes and so on. You know, you think of things that are old already, over 10 years old, but um, I never would have thought. And I admit, when I first heard of it, it was a long time ago, it was more than 10 years ago. There's a, uh, there's a website, actually, it wasn't even an app. It was before the days of really smartphones called net a -Porter. And net a -Porter is high-end fashion online. I never would have thought that you would want to buy high-end fashion. I don't mean vintage, not second-hand, not eBay, not that sort of thing. But, you know, Chanel, Hermes, all of these high-end brands online. Because to me, half the experience is, you know, the going and the looking and, the, you know, it's part of the experience. If you're going to spend that much money, you want the experience. Turns out, huge business. Huge business. Couture online, very, very successful. And not just in places where people can't get to the shops, but, you know, places where people can. So, not obvious. Sure. Through your own social networks. It's an interesting question. Um, I can't think of one place where you can go and say, I have this idea, don't steal it, tell me what you think. I, you know, I think that's asking a bit much. But as I said before, I know that through your own network, you can reach out to people who can reach out to people who can reach out to people who can actually give you some pretty good feedback. Yes, if you have no intellectual property protection, going back to your question, it's more difficult to protect your idea. But you will do your own, or you'll take your own precautions in who you talk to and what you do with the input that you get. Um, because once you go out and ask for funding, like on Kickstarter or any of the other crowdfunding sites and so on, you're exposed. You're exposed. And um, I don't know of, and I'm trying to think, maybe you know, but I don't know of anything that's sort of a one-stop shop to get feedback. That's why it's so hard. But it's doable. No, it's doable, but um, but yeah, you need to be kind of careful who you talk to. <laughs> it's true enough. <laughs> but has anyone here started a business? Is anyone thinking of starting a business? Okay, now we're getting somewhere. In what field? Don't tell me your idea. Okay. Say it in, no, no, you can say it in Russian. Just give me a moment. I'll get my, my in English. So this is not IT. Uh, this is something connected with electric equipment. And this is this involves the creation of the new device. But I know the potential customer. This is the advantage. And I have a question. Can I ask you a question? 
What the percentage of successful startups in Israel? Out of the total number of all the startups which are launched or have been launched, 10 to 20 percent will be really successful. Well, 10 percent will be really successful. Another 10 percent will be okay successful. Uh, another 30 percent will be floating. The rest will probably fail. Those are average statistics around the world. We don't have, sorry, I'm talking to myself. We don't have um, different success rates on average than the rest of the world. What we do have is a lot more activity in the system. You know, for years now, I've been speaking and saying there are 3,000 startups. There are always 3,000 startups. They're not the same 3,000 startups. Sometimes they're 3,500, you know, in good years. Sometimes they're, you know. The, the, the point is that it's always happening. And when it's always happening, then it's more likely to succeed. And, you know, if you look at this year, so Waze was sold, billion dollars. PrimeSense was sold, $350 million. Now, when they were sold to Google, to Apple, to, you know, big players um, in the field. Giving Imaging was sold, but that's over 10 years old. You know, medical device, that it's a different company. It's a company that has sales of hundreds of millions of dollars, so it's not in the same category. But there are always new things happening. The advantage of the these types of technologies is that they're relatively quick to turn around. You'll fail or you'll succeed, it's relatively quick. If you're talking about a device in electronics, it's likely to take a little bit longer, but on the same, on, when you talk about that, you're also more likely to be able to protect it with a patent or some other form of intellectual property, which I would very much urge you to consider because if you've got an actual physical device, you can usually protect it. And then you have some form of property, even if it's intellectual property, but it's something that you can work with. And uh, you can look at the intellectual property protection as you know some sort of initial patent, and then if you're successful, then you will submit some others around it. That costs a bit of money. It doesn't cost very much money in the beginning, but it does cost a bit of money, and it's very much worth considering, especially if it's your own invention, and so you protect it for, for yourself. How about your idea? Sorry, just a minute. Wait. Let me get my language. Okay. Um, I'm really interested in services because innovation does not does not necessarily is an innovation or application innovation is not, not an application uh, but I think it would be good you can use somebody's idea which is not at a given market yet this is it not in a given market yet I'm not sure I follow, sorry. For example, something that exists in a service that exists in the United States but is not available in Russia yet. To a different market, in this case, Russia. Okay, well, that makes sense. That's what I, that I, that's what I meant. and uh, I'll never get used to these things uh, but they're very good they let me speak all over the world but I always have to switch them on and off um, that makes sense and certainly when you have a large market and Russia is a fairly large local market then there are services that can be imported and it's also not just Russia because there are other Russian speaking countries around you so it's beyond just Russia. The market is probably a few hundred million people uh, in a particular language. Um, again, it requires, the basic question will be, does that service appeal to this market? 
I don't know what sort of service you're talking about, but things that are successful in, say, the United States might not be successful in Russia or in some European countries or in Asian countries, different cultures. So that's always, you know, worth thinking of. Um, the other thing worth thinking of is, does someone have any sort of rights to that service? Any type of intellectual property rights? Usually not, but it's worth it's worth understanding just so that you don't find yourself in you know in trouble. But uh, you know, one example that was done quite successfully, uh, even in Israel, was uh, you know these these coupons. Um, the discount uh, buying that's become very very popular, and uh, and one of the the first companies in Israel that started with that they simply took the idea they saw it in the U.S. they started it in Israel and eventually they were acquired by the U.S. company so they are today the local arm of the U.S. company and there are a few of them now well more than a few there are quite a few of them now. And each one focuses on a slightly different angle. You know, one is more high end, so you know it appeals to a certain a subset of the population. Everybody wants a good deal, right? Especially if it's a good deal on, say, a nice restaurant or a nice hotel or so on and so forth. So interestingly enough, the first one copied an idea. The others copied the first one. Each one appeals to a different market segment, and they all seem to survive one way or another. Um, and then they acquire each other. It will remain to be seen where they end up. I think there'll be some more consolidation. But it was all copied from, you know, one original idea somewhere else. There was someone else. There was another hand somewhere. No? There. Tell me. If you want. Just a minute. I'm with you. Because he didn't finish his sentence yet. <laughs> Let him finish. <laughs> Is it worth bringing uh, universities uh, not just to cre uh, creating ideas, but to actually manufacturing the ready-made product? Universities don't manufacture products. Yeah, I don't think that they are well equipped to actually manufacture. But what does vary among universities and countries is the degree to which they will get involved beyond the initial idea. Example, some universities may have access to funding for the early stages. Some may have incubators on site or in a technology park that's part of the university. Some may be able to help you with even further funding, not just the initial funding, but access to your next round of funding from venture capital or corporations. Some have um, people available who can help you with the management of the company, mentors and also experienced managers who are willing to come in for maybe six months and help you manage the company in the early stages. Um, there are all of these different things that are available, but usually they go up to the point of maybe facilities for incubation and funding, not really manufacturing of products. Um, I only know of maybe two examples but they were very specific and they had to do with chemical manufacturing actually of particular materials uh, in facilities that the university had. And that was mostly looking at using existing facilities beyond the regular hours. So, you know, they would use those as a sort of pilot plant for industry. But that was more of a service provided to industry. It wasn't really the manufacturing and selling of a product. Um, what type of product did you have in mind? Well, I meant materials. So for materials, that is probably the one exception. 
adopt the rule because sometimes the required manufacturing facilities are very expensive. And what companies sometimes do, they will use the university equipment, it's actually done at the nano centers in Israel as well, but they will use them, for example, you'll start a company based on your technology for a particular material, and then you will make an agreement with the university to use their facility for manufacturing. So what the university is actually doing, it's not starting a business manufacturing chemicals or materials, but it's providing a service to your company, to the new company, to manufacture for them. Is, is the difference clear? So it's the company that's doing the business, the university is a contract manufacturer. That does happen. That does happen, especially with the expensive pieces of, uh, of equipment, like the microscopy and like some of the uh, manufacturing pilot scale manufacturing facilities. Because most don't have large scale manufacturing facilities, but they do have pilot scale manufacturing facilities. But I have to say that we had an experience like that actually at the Hebrew University. And in the long run, it was not successful. It was successful in the beginning because there were a few specific projects. But in the long run, it was very hard to keep it going as a quote unquote business venture. It then became more like this to help out sometimes when it was needed and be used for research the rest of the time. That I understand. Uh, thank you, I can say in many different languages. Uh, how am I doing for time, Constantine? I haven't even looked at my timing. I'm okay then. Huh. I haven't kept you for too long. What should you consider in your venture investor? Now that is a wonderful question. I like that question. Um, and thank you for that question. There are a lot of things to consider in your venture investor. And first and foremost is, can they really help you? And can they help you beyond the money? Because when you need money, you very often take it from whoever's willing to give it to you. And sometimes what happens is later on, when things get bad, because remember failure, it does happen. And even if you don't fail, you'll have hard times because that happens to everyone. A professional investor who understands the field will be able to not only understand that this happens, accept that this happens, invest more when things are bad, but also even help you get through those periods. The difficulty with investors who are not professional is that very often when things get bad, when you really need them, they bail out. And then you're stuck at the worst possible time with no money, with no investor, and having to explain to other people what happened at that time. So I think that the first thing to check is that they know the field. I would speak to other entrepreneurs who've worked with them. There's actually a website in America, I don't know about Russia, but there's a website in America that does that, that rates venture capitalists, really, with opinions and so on and so forth, uh, from the user experience. It's on VentureBeat. But uh, it's important because you want to know that you, it's like a sort of marriage, because they take a big piece of your venture and they sit on your board. It is like a sort of Nazi. You know, marriages do fail, I know myself. But nonetheless, you try, at least when you start, to make sure that you check it out. And um, if, if you don't have direct access, then try and find, you know, all venture capitalists have websites they have, portfolio companies. Speak to two or three people and see, you know, what it's like to work with them, see what sort of support you're likely to get. You don't want them to manage the company for you, but you want to know that they'll be there for you when times are tough. And the other thing to check is that they invest in such a way that they leave money for future rounds. Again, any 
professional venture capitalists will do that. So they'll invest a certain amount now and they'll leave money for further investment rounds. That's very important because you're going to need them further down the line. You don't want investors who go in once and then have no more money to invest because they're more likely to put pressure on you and less likely to be able to bring in good people later on. And of course, it's nice if you can get on with them because you do need to work together. So that is another element. It's less important in the sense that you don't have to be best friends, but you do need to be able to understand each other professionally. So I think that that's an important element. You don't need to know everything. No, I don't think you need to know everything. But you need to find out for yourself that they know the field, for example. So if you're developing a new material, for example, okay, that's the example we just had. And you need someone who understands the physical sciences, the chemical sciences, that business. Um, and the people you're talking to have only ever invested in software and internet applications. They're probably not the right fit because they're not likely to be able to help you and they're likely to not understand when things go bad. Okay, yeah, it's sort of, I mean, that's a, an extreme example, but it's, it's that's the sort of thing I meant. Not that you need to know everything, but you do need to know that they have done similar things, that they have the right sort of contacts, um, that you share a similar vision for the venture. For example, if your vision is to grow it into a big company and you think you need these types of customers and these types of steps and so much money, you're likely to be wrong, by the way. Everybody's always wrong about these things. But that at least you share a vision, that's okay. It, that gets changed as you move along. Um, that you share a vision so that, because you become a team. The question was asked earlier about, you know, teams. Your venture investors, certainly in the early stage, they become part of your team. And if they're good venture investors, they will feel that they're part of your team. They will want to be part of your team. Not, you know, to say they'll come and work every day. But they will be part of the team. They'll be rooting for you. They'll be trying to make you successful because your success is their success at the end of the day. So that's what I meant when I said you need to ask. Not that they need to know everything or you need to know everything, but that you have to share a vision, that they have the knowledge, that they have the expertise, the understanding of the field and the contacts. It's a lot to ask, but good investors will have that. I think, thank you. This has been fun. Um, I've enjoyed it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy. Good luck with everything. And uh, I hope to see some of you again, maybe in some future round when you've got big successful companies and uh, you come and visit us, tell us about the next generation. Thank you very much. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. No.